Hello and welcome to this lecture number 43 of our course on blockchain and its applications. Today we are going to start a new topic. There will be three lectures on this topic and this topic is about identity management. So, today's lecture is the first lecture on identity management. So, these are the concepts that we plan to cover in today's lecture. First of all, we will introduce the basic concepts of identity, what it means, what is identity all about in the physical world and how we can consider digital equivalent of physical identities. We will talk about centralized management of digital identities, what it means, what are its shortcomings and then we will introduce how we can do decentralized management of digital identity. So, these are the three fundamental concepts in identity management and also in the process uh, we will see why there is a scope for using blockchains in digital identity management in a decentralized manner. The keywords for today's lecture are as follows. First of all, of course, identity followed by centralized identity management. We will also consider the concept of single sign on which many of you are already familiar with, but we will talk about it in detail. Then we will define a principle of what is called self sovereignty, what it means and why it is very important in terms of privacy and then we will talk about digital identifier. So, these are the keywords for today's lecture. So, let us move on to this basic definition and what is meant by identity. Now, if you see the physical world, people are actually known by their identities. So, typically it could be say our name, name is a very common identity. Again, because multiple persons might have the same name, say in a university there could be multiple students with the same name. So, what we try to do is that instead of using name, we use some other identifying attribute like say roll number. In an organization, we identify the employees by their employee number. So, they are, these are their identities. Also, you see that when we have say very commonly all of us know about it uh, an identity card. So, there what we see is that in that identity card actually our identity is written. It has my name, if it is a student ID card in any university. So, it will also have typically the roll number, then the age like date of birth is often given and uh, maybe the work history in the sense that in a company's identity card it is mentioned maybe the date on which the employee had joined and also the date to which this particular identity is valid like say the date of requirement and so on. Okay. Now, of course, uh, as also mentioned that it could have the address as we know that uh, uh, sometimes identity cards also have addresses. Same is true for many other types of such cards that shows our identity to some extent whether it was meant for that purpose or not, we often use it like we often uh, show our PAN card for our identity or other card when maybe checking in a hotel, though these PAN cards and uh, other cards were not really meant to be shown to the hotels, they were for other purposes, but they also serve as um, our identities. So, these are, these are what we call as identities in the physical world. If we consider that in summary, we can say that a physical identity is simply a collection of different types of attributes like as we mentioned that some of the attributes are already here uh, as uh, said, but in some cases there could be financial uh, history like for example, it is about if it is uh, it is it, not always necessary that it is written in that identity card but say people know about credit history and so on and social history. So, these are more such possible types of attributes that depending on a particular type of application could define our physical identities. So, that is something that is happening in the physical world. 
Now, if we consider now the digital world, so just like the physical world identities, in the digital world also if you see that we have different identities. So, what is meant by digital identity or what is our identity in the digital domain? So, we have for example, our email addresses. So, we keep, create Gmail ID or Yahoo ID and so on. We, we also have our say social media accounts like Facebook accounts, we have LinkedIn accounts, we have um, say our WhatsApp accounts. So, where again uh, we are having these digital identities in Facebook for example, we have our user account name and then it has got actually my uh, real name ideally, we will have say a profile picture, we can have some uh, about history. So, if you see that in the last slide we mentioned about social history and all. So, in the Facebook you can put your marital status, you can put your of course, the date of birth, the employment history, where you live. So, all these are examples of such a social history, address history and so on. And remember that in the Facebook there is that digital identity, but remember that it is not really verified whether I am indeed the person that I am claiming to be. So, it is just that there is an account name and then based on that there are a lot of other information which are associated and if people search me up on Facebook, they will get that name and associated with that they will uh, see lot of other details. Those who know me, know my face, they if, if I have really put up a nice looking photo which actually is of mine, then people will be able to recognize that this indeed is my account. But these are, these are some of the important concepts that we have to keep in mind when we talk about digital identities. Now, if there is such digital identity that is kept and then if these identities are passed on to others, say for example, any social media account, if, if the social media the owner, say for example, if we consider Facebook account. So, assume that Facebook can share the identity with other entities, I am not saying whether Facebook is doing or not, but if it does, then we do not have much control over it. So, that is an important concept. So, again, so that particular uh, so uh, online social media may not really do it, but if they do, then you do not have any control because this information is with them. And as a result, there might always be uh, scope for identity fraud, like we see here that because we do not really know who is maintaining these attributes in what form, hence it is uh, possible that uh, this identity is subject to some fraudulent activity. So, somebody can possibly create a social media account in my name and uh, somewhere from somewhere get my uh, image also or photo also and then uh, claim that person to be me and then can post certain things and people will believe that it is indeed me. So, these types of identity frauds can happen. And it is important that when people are presenting themselves, so they authenticate themselves to some service as we know if we want to log into our mail accounts, we have to authenticate ourselves by providing the password and then based on what one can do like in say Facebook, I can let people see my friend list, I can uh, allow people to read my posts or I could control that in the sense that only say my friends can see my profile picture or they can read my posts or friends of friends can do that. So, I have this type of authorization. And finally, the verification means that if I want to present my identity somewhere, for example, say I log into say Turnitin website, which you know is one of the sites, uh, one of the services that can be used for detecting plagiarism in different documents. So, there that verification is done that indeed if it is me, then if my institute has maybe a uh, subscription of Turnitin, I will be allowed to use the service or if I have any personal account, I might be able to use the service. So, there is a way of verifying my identities and based on that certain services might be allowed or might not be allowed. So, we see this example here, we have different such 
users and then assume this identity, this digital identity is now maintained in a centralized place. So, that is the important aspect of this particular slide that whatever we are talking about maintaining the identities as is written here, it is a centralized digital identity. So, the entire identity is maintained in a central location. So, for many users it is all in the central location and then if I present my identity to somebody who is going to verify it, then a copy of that digital identity that is maintained in the centralized location that will be presented to the verifier and the verifier will actually see whether indeed it is correct. So, verifier might have some way of ensuring that this indeed is my digital identity. Now, what can possibly happen is that in case there is an attacker, then an attacker who is now in between that centralized repository of digital identity as we had shown in this slide. So, now we are having this attacker in between the repository here and the verifier here, then the attacker what can do is that attacker first of all can if there is sufficient knowledge with the attacker as to how to do it, then the attacker can pick up one of those identities and then present uh, that to be his identity to the verifier. Also, if there is a scope, identity, this attacker might also change certain things like can pick up my identity and then change my photo and then present it to a verifier. So, all such possibilities can happen and the difficulty is that as a user, the holder of the identity, I do not have any control on who is now presenting my identity to a verifier. So, here what we have here is the verifier V. So, this is one of the difficulties when everything is located in a centralized repository for digital identities. And also, it is possible that since this repository is having lot of such identities of different people. Hence, it is uh, possible that attackers would be interested in attacking this centralized repository, so that they can get access to a large number of digital identities in one go itself. So, uh, that is something that always makes such centralized management of digital identities vulnerable to various types of attacks. And in real life also, you might have heard that so many identities got stolen, credit card information got stolen and so on. So, some of them are true, some of them may not be true. Sometimes even if these are stolen, then the companies tend to suppress that fact, so that people do not lose trust in them. So, these are always going to happen and uh, will be really nice targets for the attackers. So, it is important that we think about how to actually ensure that instead of centralized identity, we can have some form of decentralized identity which will come to. But before we come to that, this important concept of digital identity usage in the form of single sign on is something that we need to talk about in some detail. So, as you know that if you have say an account in Google like a Gmail account, once you log in then you can access your calendar, you can access your drive, you can access say Google Meet and, and similarly for other companies also provide similar facilities like Microsoft and so on. So, what happens is that you have this one place to sign in or sign on and then this single sign on can let you access multiple such services. So, that is the concept of single sign on. So, there is a single entity that is being used for multiple purposes and there is no need to maintain multiple identity documents. So, you do not need to have one identity document for Gmail, one for your Google Drive and one for YouTube and so on. So, it is widely conceptualized in the software industry and most of us actually are pretty aware of it and we often use it either knowingly or unknowingly, but that is what is meant by single sign on. And of course, um, that means that we have this single password to accept to access multiple services. And remember, even though we are talking about going for decentralized digital identity management, this is also an example where it is centralized, meaning that in Google in one location you are 
signing in. So, this is one single identity provider or IDP which maintains the identity and then that is used for getting multiple access. Now, it identity this identity consumers use the IDP to authenticate the identity holder. So, these identity consumers are the ones which are using this IDP to authenticate the identity holder. So, if you might have seen that if you use your uh, Google account. So, using that you may be allowed to log in to get some other services which say that we allow you to either create a new account with us or you could use your Google account to authenticate yourself. So, that means that these are now the identity consumers which are using the IDP, this is the identity provider to authenticate the identity holder, but it also means that they trust say Google for uh, doing this um, authentication of the user through that one digital identity. What is very important is that the uh, during authentication the identity is not exposed to the services means that of course, that if you are trying to get a service uh, using your uh, Google um, account login. So, which service is going to use it. So, they are not going to get your uh, password from Google. It is that Google will say that oh uh, this person has entered the correct password and hence you can go ahead and provide the service that has been asked for. So, now as I said that uh, this is a single sign on, but it is still not decentralized. So, what we have here is that see you have the user here and then the user uh, can authenticate itself with respect to this identity provider. So, from user we have this uh, authentication with the identity database maintained by the identity provider. And then once it is done, then this user can get access to multiple services like bank or post office and then some other types of services and whether it is um, government sector or private sector there are all possibilities depending on who all actually trust this particular IDP to carry out the authentication process or matching the identity of this user. So, they can always subscribe to this particular service, but it is all about digital identity that is very important. So, I could create some digital identity with some username, some password, some email ID and so on and then I could enter whatever types of uh, data I want. So, nobody is otherwise going to verify for example, my date of birth and so on. So, all these that we talked about so far that does not have anything to do with verifying whether I am really presenting my true values for the different attributes of the identity like date of birth and address and so on. In order to do it, so we have to have this additional loop which is similar to what we know as the KYC and the mobile companies they uh, do it for identity verification. So, if you see that if you want to uh, get a new SIM card, you have to fill up a form where you have to give your details like address and uh, date of birth and all sorts of other stuff. And then uh, these companies they carry out this process of KYC verification sometimes using your the fingerprint with the talking to the, uh, the other database and so on. So, they are all sorts of different ways of ensuring that now we are tying up uh, a real identity of a user to this digital or virtual identity. So, this loop is important when typically there are some financial transactions that might get carried out and so on, there are some sensitive operations that will be done. So, it is important that this sort of additional loop is included to tie up this digital identity with the physical attributes of this particular person, but even then we are still talking about centralized such system and we will see that how we can move on to now decentralized management. So, now we are talking about decentralizing digital identity. So, in decentralized digital identity there is no centralized trusted identity provider or registry. So, there is no central location where all these types of information will be maintained. So, there is a of course, digital representation of physical identity that is what we want. Now, there are two major problems and this is very, very important. One is to verify the one is to verify the identity uh, issuer. That means, that how does the verifier know that indeed that identity has been issued by a proper 
identity issuer and verifying the identity holder. So, how does it know that it is the correct holder to whom this particular identity was issued is indeed the one who is now presenting this identity to me. So, these are the two challenges and why these are the two challenges? This is because that if we have this type of attacker now in between, then what the attacker might do that attacker might present some identity and give an impression that that attacker indeed is the real holder of that identity as presented to the verifier. So, it becomes difficult for the verifier to check whether it is really was issued by the issuer. So, even if the identity of the issuer can be verified correctly, the fact that it was actually issued to the proper holder or and not to the attacker, it is very difficult for the verifier to differentiate between these two. So, what can happen out of this is that say a holder might have presented her identity to the issuer uh, to the verifier, I am sorry to the verifier uh, on say Monday and then whatever was presented the attacker could get a copy of that and then on Tuesday the attacker presents that to be his own. So, this is a problem if we have simple ways of maintaining such digital identities and then they are presented to the verifiers and there is no way of controlling the way different attackers can actually act. So, what is important here is that we need to ensure that we have some protection and there is a fundamental principle of digital identity management. One is what is called self-sovereign identity. So, privacy control meaning that if as I had mentioned previously, if I cannot control when and to whom my identity would be presented for verification and which of the attributes of my identity will be verified to the uh, will be will be presented to the verifier, then there is a problem because that might lead to my leakage of privacy, people might know about my date of birth which I may not want. So, in self sovereign identity in this concept what is important is that identity should be controlled, the presentation of the identity should be controlled by the individuals. So, they should have full control and ownership of their identity information. So, these are these attributes that we talked about and the individuals can control the use of their own identity profile for business and social interaction. So, I can decide not to give my uh, some of the attributes known to the different companies, but my, I might be willing to let my friends know about it. So, it could be some differential treatment I can make and it is very similar to use of our physical identity. Let me give you an example. Suppose my board after my board exam say my class 12 exam I complete, I get a certificate, I also get a mark sheet. Similarly, a university can issue a degree certificate and also a transcript to a student. Now, depending on the requirement, the student might present the transcript only or might present the certificate only or might present both of them. For example, for a job, the company might be interested in knowing whether the student uh, is a graduate and then it is enough to present the degree certificate. It is not required for the student to present the transcript, but for admission to a university, the university might be interested not only on the fact that the student has completed that degree, but also what were the grades. So, you see that based on the requirement, this particular individual would be able to control just as the way one can control the presentation of physical identities. So, the holder is possessing the ID and holder chooses to whom to present the ID. But of course, that also means that it puts a lot of burden on the individual users. They should be knowing when to present, how to present, how to separate out the different attributes and so on. So, that could lead to some burden on the individuals. So, with this we are motivated enough to have this concept of decentralized identifiers or DIDs or DIDs. Now, this indeed is a W3C recommendation and I would always suggest that you go through uh, this particular site, it has got a lot of valuable information, I mean it is almost invaluable I would say and then you can get more details about what we are talking in this particular lecture and in the next um, few lectures. So, it is uh, very well recommended that you please visit this site 
to get all the details about how these DIDs are actually set up and how they are used. So, coming back, these DIDs, they provide verifiable decentralized digital identity. So, very important, it is verifiable and it is decentralized. And it is designed to be decoupled from centralized registries. So, there will be no control of centralized registries and identity providers will not be able to determine or, or control to whom I can present my identity. And of course, there will be no notion of this certificate uh, authorities. So, there will be no particular centralized uh, certificate authorities who will be controlling all these things. And holder of a uh, decentralized identifier or deed can prove its ownership on the deed without the help of any other party. So, it is very, very important that if a holder is presenting the deed, so holder has a deed and the holder is now presenting the deed to a verifier, then the verifier should be convinced that indeed it was uh, issued to this particular holder. So, and that should not need interference or intervention of any other third party. So, this is very important requirement of a decentralized identifier or did and as I said it is a W3C uh, proposed recommendation and then you please um, go through this particular side. And now, this is the architecture of DID. So, what is a DID? So, it is basically there is a DID URL as we show it is indeed uh, URI as we will see in the next uh, slide. And typically, it has this kind of a format that this is written like this that uh, DID and then shown here. So, this is uh, going to be the structure of a DID and a DID such URL actually refers to a DID document and these DID documents, these are all recorded on a verifiable data registry. So, this will all go into a verifiable collection of these DID documents, but these will all be kept in a decentralized manner. So, in this figure we are showing it is going to a verifiable data registry as if it is one a particular unit, but remember that this is what is going to be actually decentralized. There is a deed controller who controls what are the attributes are there the, of the deed subject and the deed controller could be the subject himself or herself. And then this one deed refers to one deed subject. This deed is recorded on this verifiable data registry and from this did this entire address, it will resolve to a particular deed document and then if the holder of this deed presents it to a verifier. So, verifier will be able to get the details from the verifiable data registry. So, if we look at how it actually happens. So, this is the overall flow as you can see as numbered that did it is a unique ERI which identifies a subject. So, here is number 2. So, this subject is what subject is entity which could be a person, organization and so on which is being identified by this particular did. So, if you see that there is this one particular did the example did that we are giving here is did colon example colon 1, 2, 3 which is referring to maybe one particular person and then it is there in the verifiable data registry and how did it get into the verifiable data registry? It was done by the deed controller which has the permission to create this deed for say a deed subject and then if required it can change the content of the deed document and as I said that this deed controller in some cases could be the deed subject itself. So, that means, it is a self certification uh, done by the subject. So, depending on different types of applications even self certification might be good enough. So, this deed document finally, will be there recorded in the verifiable data registry. So, in this architecture what we see is so far that there are multiple possible controllers. So, it is not at the discretion of one centralized controller. So, many controllers can create such deeds for many different subjects. So, this is decentralized. Also, what is important is that these deed documents 
will be stored in verifiable data registries, but these data registries will be indeed decentralized. And why now you might ask that why are we talking so much about this digital identifiers and the decentralized digital identifiers and so on in a course on blockchain and that is the crux of it of what we are so far discussing today in today's lecture is that this verifiable data registry as we are saying will be decentralized and as you can see that it is going to be a storage of these data documents. So, indeed we can actually use blockchain for storing these data documents. So, this verifiable data registry could be implemented using blockchains and that is the reason why we are talking about these decentralized identifiers in the context of a course on blockchain and indeed it is one of the important applications of blockchain and it is very difficult otherwise to create such a verifiable data registry that verifiable as I might strike that chord that in blockchain if you store something it can be verified by anybody. So, it is verifiable registry and it is decentralized which is also one of the important properties of course of blockchains. So, it is this particular motivation behind our discussion of decentralized identifiers in the context of blockchain. So, finally, if we conclude today's lecture what we have done is that we have introduced the fundamental concepts of identity management, what is physical identity, what is identity to start with and then how physical identity is related to digital identity, what is single sign on and self sovereign principles and so on. And also we have talked about centralized identity management and what are its pitfalls and then motivated why it is important to go for decentralized identity management. And the first step towards that is this W3C recommendation which is that did and we saw the website where uh, we have these details as I mentioned. And then finally, um, what we have seen is roughly how this deed would be organized its architecture and then we motivated that this implementation of verifiable decentralized data registry can be done using blockchain and we will see in our subsequent lectures how this indeed can be done. So, with that we come to the end of this lecture and uh, the references there are many web resources as we have mentioned from time to time different sites those are the invaluable sources of information for this topic. So, I would encourage you to go through those. Thank you very much for your attention.